all of you to this lecture sponsored by the Center for American Studies and Research. Today we're lucky to have with us uh, Professor Robert Reed Farr from the City University of New York um, Graduate Center. He's a professor of English and American Studies. Um, professor Reed Farr uh, received his PhD from Yale University. Um, he has taught uh, at Johns Hopkins He's also been a visitor at Chicago, University of Chicago, University of Oregon, Humboldt University of Berlin, Swarthmore College, and this semester at Oxford uh, in England. He is the um, uh, author of three books, Conjugal Union, The Body, the House, and the Black American, 1999, Black Gay Man, Essays, 2001, and Once You Go Black, Choice, Desire, and the Black American Intellectual, 2007. Um, he lives in Brooklyn, uh, and he has a new project, which is uh, uh, something he's uh, taking up in today's lecture. And today's lecture is called Imperial Remains, Langston Hughes, and the Spanish Trace in the Black American Imaginary. Uh, please welcome Dr. Robert Reed Farr. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, I'll just say two brief things. One is that uh, I uh, I got to Beirut officially on Saturday night, and then I was tricked by daylight savings time, so it immediately became uh, on Sunday. So. Uh, I've only been here for 24 hours. I really uh, like it very much, though. And if there's one of those goofy uh, Beirut Board of Tourism uh, things, they really should call me because I, I thought, wow, what a fantastic city this is. An amazing place. Uh, the other thing is that I've broken all the rules, and I've um, uh, written a particularly uh, uh, long essay, which is my way. So I apologize for that in advance. So I won't, uh, I won't bore you with setting it up. I'll just get going. This essay is about origins, or perhaps better put, it is about the ways in which certain facts of history and society are all too often knowingly, even self-consciously, obscured and suppressed within what passes for American cultural and intellectual history. It is an essay that at its core is a critique of the tendency to favor narratives of American and black American development that if not always triumphal, are most certainly positivistic. As such, it is one small part, one of many, of an increasingly vigorous effort to disrupt a fairly simplistic conception of US development that turns on the belief that America, our America, is in fact nothing if not the simple continuation of British and most specifically English forms of government, commerce, language, and culture. This is also, a, however, an essay about futurity, or as the literary and cultural critic Brent Hayes Edwards would have it, the futures of diaspora. It is a work that rejects the all too often backwards focused tendency within African diaspora studies, the assumption that the first matter to which the descendants of enslaved New World Africans must attend is the violent separation from origin, the defeat of the many noble peoples of a benighted continent, the end of culture. Indeed, where I stand apart from, my, from many scholars of African American, black American history and society is that I tend not to assume quite as readily as many others do that the African diaspora must be read first and foremost as a world historical process in which our enslaved forebearers were victims but never agents or to throw down perhaps a bit prematurely the conceptual gauntlet with which I hope to provoke my readers, I reject the notion of innocent African primitives trapped below deck in the holds of European and American ships, no more responsible for or understanding of their fates than the tobacco, sugar, cotton, and rum with which they shared fetid, cramped, and suffocating space. Instead, I would suggest, even within the limitations that such a project necessarily inhabits, that the continued vigor of an enterprise such as African American, Black American, African diaspora studies is dependent upon a self-consciously creative reimagining of the removal, forced or otherwise, 
of African peoples and cultures from one location to another. That is to say, in these pages, the diasporic is celebrated not because it is somehow the culmination of a simple-minded Anglo-American civilizing process, not because it has allowed the transfer of us from there to here, but on the contrary, because it represents the possibility, or rather, a possibility for new forms of culture, ethics, and identity. My goal then is to take up at least one is to take at least one faltering step toward theorizing, understanding, and perhaps enacting the dream of a global belonging, a transnational patrimony, a universalist patriotism. I should admit, admit from the start then that part of what I hope to court in these pages is the very theoretical and ideological quandary that stands at the heart of what it means to be a contemporary black American. We are a people in transit. Though I began my comments with consideration of origins, I'm convinced that the much more significant matter for students of black American history and culture is in fact the nature of our journey. Indeed, one of the major claims of this essay is that narratives motivated by the will either to return to an always highly mythologized African originality or to establish some sort of black new world utopia have long since run their course. This thing gets you a bit closer to understanding why I have criticized those Anglo-American rhetorical and ideological practices that work to silence or dull consideration of the simple reality that throughout the history, that throughout its history, the United States has been not only a multicultural, but also a multilingual society, a not yet properly nationalized state that has warped with impunity British, European, African, and Asian idioms for use within American text and context, such that somehow 300 million Americans, U.S. citizens and residents, are for better or worse thought to compose a single and singular people, indivisible and divinely ordained, even as the everyday experiences of the many individuals, bumping, tired and irritated, yet strangely invigorated down the ever unfinished, ever crowded streets of Brooklyn and Chicago, Denver and St. Louis, Portland, El Paso, and Los Angeles might suggest otherwise. Thus, as you surely have discerned already, the politics on display here turn upon my claiming for black American individuals and communities the right and the pleasure of acknowledging without hesitation or undue hand wringing that we can never be quite certain of our beginnings much less our roots, R-O-E-T-E-S. Therefore, as I argue for the need to read black American literature and culture in relation to the United States' centuries-long engagements and confrontations with Spain and the Hispanic, I am not particularly concerned to prove what I take to be the rather obvious matter that the so-called essence of the black American, or any American for that matter, can, ever, can never really be subsumed under the label Anglo. Instead, I will utilize the largely ignored history of a specific black American engagement with Spanish, and more generally Iberian, culture and history as a sort of heuristic, a case study, if you will, that takes as its end point the consideration of the open-ended conception of diaspora, for which, hey, for which Edwards has called. My focus, therefore, is not so much on location as possibility. I ask not where, but how. Given these concerns, I will point out that though, like many scholars in the United States and Europe, Europe and elsewhere, I have been altogether inspired by the work of sociologist and cultural historian Paul Gilroy, especially the arguments in his seminal text, The Black Atlantic, Modernity and Double Consciousness, regarding the nationalist parochialism that often underwrites the study of black communities and cultures. I'm nonetheless in agreement with, these, with those scholars who criticized Gilroy for the fact that the so-called Black Atlantic that he imagines is a rather decidedly and insistently anglophonic entity. Indeed, Gilroy tends to ignore the history of huge numbers of black persons living, on both, living both on the African continent and in the Western Hemisphere, the majority of whom reside within communities bounded by the South Atlantic, not the North, 
speaking Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Dutch, not to mention Creole, African, and other Aboriginal languages much more often than they do English. Moreover, he largely misses the fact that the history of the United States itself has been one in which the dominance of the English language, the ease with which Americans often imagine ourselves as sons and daughters of Britannia, has been achieved through oftentimes vicious repression of competing linguistic and cultural traditions, repression that has been pointedly enacted upon black American individuals and communities. While I'm addressing this point, I would be remiss if I did not at least gesture toward the work of historians such as Eric Hobsbawm and Terence Ranger, who have ably demonstrated that Englishness, Britishness, and Europeanness are themselves somewhat thinly narrated and relatively recently produced fictions based on profound oversimplifications of centuries of cross-fertilization between the various peoples of Europe, Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and the Americas. I will say again, however, that even as I am eager to demonstrate the supreme importance of Spanish and Iberian influences on the United States, even as I question and bemoan the fact that these influences have come to be so muted outside of the very limited confines of Spanish and Portuguese departments, or perhaps the more broad shoulder programs in history and linguistics and American studies, I nonetheless do not take the matter of what I have called the Spanish trace as an endpoint in and of itself, but instead as a key tool in my efforts to imagine a progressive, expansive, and future-oriented African diaspora studies. That is to say, though my focus is narrower than that of Gilroy, and my ultimate goals, like his, are global. I will submit to you, then, that a key starting point in this effort is consideration of the fact that the United States became a self-consciously imperial nation only after it divested Spain of the most of the last of its most significant overseas colonies, particularly Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines during the Spanish-American War of 1898. More to the point, the prosecution of what was dubbed the Splendid Little War, referring to the United States as relatively easy victory over the Spaniards, accomplished between the months of April and August, with engagements in Cuba, Puerto Rico, and a remarkable naval victory in Manila, was self-consciously understood by President McKinley and other me members of the American political elite as a necessary continuation of the United States' role as a specifically white Anglo-American country whose destiny was to dominate presumably backwards colored peoples in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. Or as Indiana Senator Albert J. Beveridge rather poignantly observed, quote, the American Republic is part of the movement of a race, the most masterful race in history. The race movements are not to be stayed by the hand of man. They are mighty answers to divine commands. Their leaders are not only statesmen of peoples, they are prophets of God. The inherent tendencies of a race are its highest law. They proceed and survive all statutes, all constitutions, end quote. In the wake of comments such as these, it takes no great stretch of intellect or imagination to understand that with the acquisition of Alaska with its largely aboriginal population in 1867, the consolidation of the United States' influence in Latin America, home to huge communities of blacks, mulatos, and mestizos, the annexation of Asian, Hawaii, and importantly, the near total domination of the Cuban economy and its foreign policy after the enactment of the Platt Amendment, American Republicans, and the guise of a military newly unified after the national horror of the Civil War, had little trouble understanding themselves as the white prophets of God's divine command. This helps explain why the country did indeed expend an inordinate amount of resources both in terms of treasure and human potential, in order to prosecute white supremacist and imperialist wars that if not exactly holy, were certainly profitable. Not to belabor the point, but the fact that between 1898 and 1919, the United States military invaded not only Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines, but also Mexico, the Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, and Haiti, ought to give pause to even the most committed apologists for ideologies of American imperial destiny. 
Morver, the nonstop and wildly successful March of America, and one must also say European racist and racialist ideologies around the globe was seemingly marred only by the successful seven-year insurgency of Filipino nationalists inexplicably resistant to trading their Spanish colonizers for Americans eager to gain a foothold in the Pacific that might allow them access to European-dominated China, thereby alleviating the American displeasure at literally not having been invited to the party during the 1885 Berlin Conference where Leopold of Belgium negotiated with his peers in order to establish the protocols of European colonization on the African continent. While considering these matters, it is equally important that one take into account that on the U.S. home front, progressive era Americans had long since tired of quote unquote protecting the newly achieved rights and civil liberties of the country's recently freed slave population. Indeed, by the time of the Spanish-American War, the rather shameful curtailments of the recently won rights of the freed men and women were already well underway. In 1877, Union troops were withdrawn from the capitals of the former Confederacy, ending Reconstruction and essentially allowing for the re-disenfranchisement of black men. In 1883, the Supreme Court ruled the Civil Rights Act of 1875 unconstitutional. And as is well known, in 1896, only two years before the Spanish-American War, the court rendered its infamous Plessy v. Ferguson decision, allowing for the racial segregation of public conveyances, thereby ushering in the era of state-sponsored Jim Crow in the United States, an era that did not close until the 1954 Brown v. Topeka Board of Education decision. I would suggest, therefore, that the only potential difficulties that the United States faced as it set about establishing in itself as what one might call with only a bit of winking a world-class imperial power were not, in fact, military, nor even economic, but instead ideological. Scholars such as Amy Kaplan have rightly pointed out that American intellectuals were hardly unified in their approval of the country's new imperial vigor. On both the left and the right, novelists such as Mark Twain and Thomas Dixon, reformers like James Adams and Samuel Gompers, and even politicians such as the former South Carolina Senator Benjamin Tillman, fretted variously that the United States had no inherent right to expand itself beyond the boundaries of the continental United States, that its incursions into foreign lands aped the excesses of decadent European powers, and importantly, that the inclusion of so many people of color under the protection of the American flag risked tilting the country toward the type of mongrelism that the imperialist wars were in part designed to prevent. Even more importantly, however, was the altogether awkward reality that though the ideologies that were transported from the towns and cities, fields and factories of a newly invigorated American polity to pacify and civilize a backwards, primitive, colored world might have been lily white. The personnel who enacted these procedures certainly were not. For the first time in the United States history, in the United States history, black American soldiers would leave the U.S. in order to serve in a foreign war, precipitating waves of celebration among the black civilian population who responded to the novel idea of their blue, 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 brown, yellow, red countrymen's faces representing the power and dignity of the United States government and military abroad. Even more importantly, it was hardly lost on black Americans, soldiers and, civilis and civilians alike, that the service of black men in the military could be utilized to great effect as a propaganda tool in the ongoing effort to reclaim many of the political and social gains that uh, these smoked Yankees, as the Spaniards derisively named them, would gain a, excuse me, I'm going to read that sentence again. Even more importantly, it was hardly lost on black Americans, soldiers and civilians alike, that the service of black men in the military could be utilized uh, to great effect as a propaganda tool in the ongoing effort to re reclaim many of the political and social gains that they had lost with the close of the Reconstruction. If that effort should fail, 
it was assumed that these smoked Yankees, as the Spaniards derisively named them, would gain a toehold for black Americans in the less racially hostile environments of Cuba and Puerto Rico, and while white American soldiers would profit from close contact with the presumably more relaxed and tolerant culture of the Caribbean. Almost immediately, however, the bizarre incongruity of former slaves and their descendants actively assisting in the process of imperialist and white supremacist domination of both subject peoples and even the none too racially liberal Spanish colonialists would become apparent. The first Afro-American troops to be sent into battle were the four all-black regiments of the regular non-volunteer army, the 24th and 25th Infantry, and the 9th and 10th Cavalry. The cavalrymen, or buffalo soldiers as they were commonly called, had already distinguished themselves as fighters in the ongoing wars of native pacification. Their story represented, however, one of the several incredibly vulgar ironies of black American military service. That is to say, their participation in the Indian Wars was itself a factor of the fear among government and military elites, the specter of large numbers of armed black men rubbed entirely too roughly against the racial mores of late 19th and early 20th century America. Thus, all regular black troops were stationed west of the Mississippi River in areas of the country then undergoing what is best, perhaps best described as a process of ethnic cleansing in which aboriginal peoples were relegated to increasingly small and vigorously policed reservations in order to make way for white and occasionally black colonists from the east. Even more galling to the black American population, however, was the near total absence of black officers in the army. Apart from a handful of chaplains, no black military officers served in any branch of the American military. Some branches had no black personnel at all. Save Charles Young, graduate of the Army's Officer Training Academy at West Point and professor of military science at All Black Wilberforce University. Eventually, however, as a sort of liberal social experiment, Commissions would be granted to men in three additional all-black volunteer units, the 8th Illinois, the 23rd Kansas, and the 3rd North Carolina. Moreover, proving yet again the American and European propensity for daringly fanciful flights of racialist fancy, in 1898, the War Department created 10 volunteer units composed of men who were presumed to be immune to yellow fever, malaria, to immune to yellow fever, resurrecting the centuries old belief that persons of African descent were unlikely to contract yellow fever, malaria, and a host of other tropical diseases, the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th volunteer infantry were composed, therefore, entirely of black men, thereby allowing some 30 black American army regulars to receive commissions in these immune units. Still, the skirmishes over rank, the placement of black bases, and the continued hostility of whites to their black compatriots, whether in uniform or not, tended to pale in comparison with the rather brisk exchange that took place in the American press over the abilities of black soldiers relative to white Americans, Cubans, and Spaniards. Afro-American military men wrote literally hundreds of letters to black newspapers celebrating their discipline and bravery during the war, particularly in the key battles of El Carné, Las Guasimas, and most especially, and most importantly, San Juan Hill. These missives had a profound effect on the civilian population as black newspaper editors placed the text in prominent positions within their papers and pointed out repeatedly the travesty of the United States government's sending soldiers who generally could not vote, hold office, join unions, sit in educational religious institutions reserved for whites, or even walk without harassment down many American streets, risking and sometimes giving their lives to lift the imperial yoke of acquisitive, effete Spanish monarchy and settler of an acquisitive, effete Spanish monarchy, monarchy and settler class from the necks of the exploited populations of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. The white press, meanwhile, was quick to answer these charges, claiming repeatedly that black soldiers behaved as ruffians while they waited in Florida and other southern states for transport to Cuba and Puerto Rico as cowards when they finally faced live enemy fire on the battlefield. 
The seriousness of this debate over the competence and civility of black military men was made evident when Theodore Roosevelt, future president of the United States and hero of the legendary, if largely overblown, tale of American soldiers charge up San Juan Hill, joined the fray. And his history of the American invasion of Cuba, the Rough Riders, the history of the first United States volunteer cavalry, the work that perhaps more than any other would secure his iconic status in American culture. Roosevelt acknowledges the presence of black troops and celebrates in a decidedly paternalistic manner the black men's loyalty to their white officers. At the same time, however, understanding what the stakes were of admitting to the ability of black soldiers to comport themselves admirably in battle, especially battles in which the logic of their loyalty to one white supremacist government versus another was questionable. Roosevelt set about to disabuse the American public of any untoward notions that they might have begun to develop about the ability of blacks to act on the international stage. Claiming that after their white officers had been killed, the blacks, unlike either the regular or volunteer white soldiers, began to retreat to the rear lines the scion of New York wealth and rising star within the Republican Party explained in a typically self-congratulatory manner that, quote, I jumped up and walking a few yards to the rear drew my revolver, halting the retreating troops, and called out to them that I appreciated the gallantry with which they had fought and would be sorry to hurt them, but that I would shoot the first man who on any pretense whatsoever went to the rear. Vowing to keep his word in this manner, his threats were seconded by, quote, cowpunchers, hunters, and miners, who solemnly nodding their heads repeat, quote, he always does, he always does. I hope that it is clear by this point that part of what I've been attempting to demonstrate is that the practice of imperialism, American and otherwise, is in fact always heavily underwritten by a variety of forms of representation, including the literary, Indeed, as uh, Maria de Guzman has demonstrated, in addition to the many exchanges between Americans about the service of black men during the Spanish-American War, there was a near constant attempt on the part of American writers and visual artists to, de to de depict the Spanish as childish, petulant, cruel, and surprisingly old-fashioned. Thus, Roosevelt's depiction of black American troops as cowardly and indeed minstrel-like was but one aspect of a rather large body of progressive era literature that attempted to establish an American vocabulary of empire that established the necessity of white dominance over all people of color, but that skirted, oftentimes in the most awkward fashion, the fact that white supremacy could not be easily separated from the intra-racial class dominance that would in fact be a cornerstone of Roosevelt's presidency. The reference in the previous quote to cowpunchers, hunters, and miners who readily sign off on the future president's racialist threats gestures towards the cult of acquiescence or so-called consensus that would enable elites like Roosevelt to not only disregard with impunity the demands of American working people and the many labor confrontations that rocked progressive era America, but also to justify the lynching and mob violence that was regularly practiced against black Americans and others, and that was ratified in the writing of white supremacist imperialist artists like Roosevelt's close friend and classmate at Harvard, Owen Wister, whose wildly successful 1902 novel, The Virginian, placed into the mouths of simple southern accented cowpunchers the very logic of racial hierarchy, uh, imperial aggression, and extra legal mob, by, mob justice that underwrote the ideological structures supporting the self-consciously white supremacist imperialism that I have attempted to outline. This, then, is hopefully an at least somewhat adequate sketch of the historical context in which the famed American novelist, poet, journalist, essayist, librettist, and playwright John Mercer Langston Hughes came of age and produced his deeply compelling works. My nomination of Hughes is an emblematic figure in the history of Afro-American and Spanish cross -cultural, cultural cross-fertilization. will come as no great surprise to those of you familiar with his life and art. Indeed, Hughes's example 
is utilized to great effect in Brent Edwards' own call for scholars of the African diaspora to begin the somewhat awkward work of imagining an open-ended conception of the diaspora. Moreover, as the literary critic Vera Kaczynski has shown, in both Spain and Latin America, Hughes is wildly admired and widely translated. His influence on par with the likes of Bob Longfellow and Bob Walt Whitman. Born in Joplin, Missouri in 1902, four years after the close of the Spanish-American War, and at the apex of the progressive era in American politics and culture, Hughes, though reared in genteel poverty by his mother and grandmother after the divorce of his parents, was a descendant of one of the country's most distinguished black families. Named for his great uncle, John Mercer Langston, who in 1888, more than a decade after the official end of Reconstruction, became the first black elected to the United States House of Representatives from the state of Virginia, Hughes often moved as a youth with his mother and grandmother from one Midwestern town to another, including Oberlin, Ohio, where his maternal grandmother, Mary Patterson, was one of the first black women to attend the prestigious Oberlin College. Mary Patterson's first husband, Sheridan Leary, died long before Hughes' birth, when as a member of the interracial group of men who accompanied the white radical visionary, John Brown, he helped attack the military arsenal at Harper's Ferry. Virginia in an ill-fated attempt to acquire weapons, arm the slaves of Virginia, and foment a Christian revolution against the white oligarchy of the slave South. After marrying a second time to Charles Henry Langston, a member of a prominent Ohio abolitionist family, Mary Patterson Leary became Mary Patterson Langston, eventually giving birth to a daughter, Caroline, the mother of John Mercer Langston Hughes. An ill-suited couple whose his parents ended their marriage while Langston was still quite young. Thus Langston, his brother John and his mother, an aspiring actress, bordered with the succession of family members while his father made his way to Cuba and Mexico, hoping to escape both the ugliest aspects of American racism and what he saw as black complicity and complacency in the face of lynching, Jim Crow, and bare nippled white economic exploitation. This move on the part of Hughes' father proved to be a boon for young Langston, however, for not only did his trips to Mexico, where his father eventually became a quite prominent business person and property owner, begin Hughes' fascination with language, uh, giving him an excellent command of Spanish by the time he reached early adulthood, but also kindled, kindled in Hughes a sort of American wanderlust that would, throughout his life, act as an engine for his creative and intellectual endeavors. In a posthumously published essay entitled Just Traveling, Hughes writes, quote, the nice thing about my typewriter is that it's always ready to go. It never says stay home as friends and relatives are often in the habit of advising. The result is we usually travel alone, me and my portable. Sometimes I feel alone too and lonely, but not often. The point here is that Hughes's artistic practice as represented by that ever-ready, infinitely agreeable typewriter, affordable no less, is indistinct from his will to travel. Indeed, though Hughes is most clearly associated with the Harlem Renaissance and the New York neighborhood from which this literary movement took its name, not to mention what might call a what one might call a blues or a jazz aesthetic, the truth is that Hughes, the author of two memoirs that focused almost exclusively on writing and traveling, the Big C, 1940, and I Wonder as I Wander, 1956, actually produced as much of his literature in Moscow, Paris, California, North Carolina, the West Coast of Africa, Shanghai, Tokyo, Mexico City, Havana, Valencia, and Madrid as he did in the storied village of Harlem. More telling still, Hughes was an extremely accomplished translator of both Francophone and Hispanic, and Hispanic writers, including Gabriela Mistral, Mistral, Mistral excuse me, Nicolas Guillén, Jacques Roman, and significantly the martyred Spanish poet Federico García Lorca. What I will attempt, therefore, is not so much to read Hughes out of the Harlem blues jazz context that cling so persistently to his name, as to suggest that what underwrites these texts and contexts, these texts and textualities, 
the ideological substructure of Hughes's work was a trans or supranationalist worldview that is altogether easy for contemporary critics to either gloss over or ignore altogether. At the same time, I will argue that Hughes's efforts at speaking across national and linguistic difference, throwing his voice across the Atlantic, if you will, though laudable, did at times miss their remarks. And though I will continue to remain mindful of the many places in Hughes's literature in which he bemoans, uh, quote, the characteristic reluctance of most, this is Hughes, the, character, the characteristic reluctance of most North American Negroes to pioneer abroad, end quote. And even as I will attempt during the remainder of this essay to read Hughes within both black American and Spanish context, I'm nonetheless altogether aware that whether or not Hughes thought of his black American compatriots as somehow less than cosmopolitan, or perhaps like his father, as far too timid and complacent in the face of segregation and white supremacy, I cannot forget that Hughes took seriously, sometimes for the better, at other, at other times the worse, the belief, the conviction really, that the lives and what one might call the cultural richness of the black American community were the fount from which he drew inspiration. Quote, there is no longer any need of a bridge between the artist and the people, Hughes writes, for the thing created becomes immediately a part of, of those for whom, from whom it was created. The poem, the picture, the song is only water drawn from the well of the people and given back to them in a cup of beauty so that they may drink and in drinking understand themselves, end quote. There are, however, a number of rather complex difficulties for the reader who understands black identity as not the veil that separates one from the rest of humanity, nor even the bridge between author and reader that Hughes so eloquently dismisses, but instead is that only half discerned, largely ill-defined essence that though dressed in the robes of the particular is somehow always an announcement of the universe. I would argue, moreover, that this matter is, in fact, precisely the conceptual ideological difficulty that was faced by the black soldiers of the Spanish-American War, who were charged with announcing the entry of the black American into the modern world, while at the same time forwarding the very practice of white supremacy and imperialism that they hoped that their service might help to disrupt. I must wonder, then, if part of what makes this rather common dilemma so difficult for students of literature and culture is the fact that we do not tend to take it seriously as we might the simple fact that violence is so often the answer given to the question of how one might discern and announce the universal in the particular. Or to push my thinking and perhaps my readers' admirable patience to their limits, I will suggest that though it is easy enough to assume that violence is the very antithesis of culture, Indeed, the thing that makes itself known through the burning of books, the looting of museums, and worse yet, the killing of artists and intellectuals. Perhaps we should allow, at least for a moment, the idea that there is no easily discernible line of demarcation between the violent, the cultural, and the artistic. Trailing René Girard along the wide, finely cut path that he has prepared for an entire generation of critics and scholars, I will attempt to press myself beyond simply acknowledging a culture of violence in the prosecution of the American Imperial Project and toward consideration of the violence of culture that attends the work of white supremacists and their black American detractors alike. Reading the idea embedded in the title of American radical James Neugas's posthumously published Spanish Civil War memoir, War is Beautiful, is something other than metaphor. I will argue that the key challenge for scholars like Hayes Edwards and myself, scholars who would announce a future-oriented, open-ended, and celebratory conception of the African diaspora, is that it may be impossible, or at least inadvisable, to avoid the very transnational, transcultural roots produced through violent and martial incursions made upon the cultural and sociological landscape in the name of the very forces of imperialism and white supremacy whom our efforts are designed to counteract. My somewhat cautious critique of Hayes Edwards then is that even as he utilizes the example of Langston Hughes in his highly provocative call for an African diasporic future, he tends to miss the point that Hughes was at once a poet, 
a cosmopolitan, a traveler, and a partisan of an anti-fascist movement that made no bones about the necessity, the beauty, if you will, of both violent resistance, no pasaran, and a utilitarian artistic practice. I will turn now to two examples drawn from Hughes's memoir, I Wonder as I Wander, both of which, one comic, the other tragic, were designed as commentaries on the Spanish Civil War, which Hughes, again like the black soldiers of the Spanish-American War, covered for a number of news outlets, particularly the Baltimore Afro-American. Hughes's arrival, however, the site had become a somewhat tragically comic military and ideological front, operating much like San Juan Hill, both as, both as a daily, if not exactly hotly contested military objective, and as a potent symbol of the absurdity of wartime violence, having been repeatedly bombed by German and Italian pilots and fired upon by soldiers from both sides of the conflict, who had not only dug opposing trenches around the campus, but also taken over university buildings and indeed competing sections of the same buildings in order to advance their political and military objectives. The narrative that Hughes relates of his unlikely visit to this even more unlikely front in the struggle against fascism turns upon his increasingly outraged descriptions of the ridiculous and obscene request of the female tourist, particularly one woman who had created a minor scandal on the streets of Madrid as she sallied forth in a large-rimmed, lacy, rather floppy white hat as protection against the potential damage that might be caused by Madrid's famously intense yet somehow profoundly indifferent midsummer sun. As they toured the campus, listening to Hughes's passionate and inspiring tales of illiterate loyalist soldiers being taught to write their names in the very trenches where they risked their lives for the cause of Spanish freedom, the women became increasingly bored and disappointed, and finally the boldest of the group, she of the large, grimmed, lacy, floppy white hat, insisted over the objections of the Spanish old soldiers that they be taken to the parts of the university where the danger of being fired upon was quite real, so that they might look out from loyalist foxholes and see for themselves the fascist revolutionaries lurking in their trenches not more than 100 yards away. Strangely enough, and for reasons that remain rather murky, but the Hughes chalks up to at the generally obliging nature of Spaniards, he and his flock of female tourists were escorted to the limits of the loyalist fortifications, the very ramparts of liberty and equality, whereupon the fascist soldiers, immune to the dictates of fashion, but not so far gone as to be incapable of taking up their parts in an obviously staged practical joke, sparred at the large, lacy, floppy white hat and fired a round of dum-dum ammunition, frightening the women back to their hotels and leaving Hughes with a somewhat unremarkable wound where one of the bullets had nicked his arm. I would submit that what makes this story funny are not only the several elements, dum-dum bullets, wartime tourists, obliging Spaniards, mid Midwestern ladies and a dangerous European spree, large brimmed, lacy, rather floppy white hat that Hughes is obviously included in order to both shock and amuse his readers, but also the fact that Hughes seemingly lacks any deep understanding of his own part in this rather ridiculous charade of liberal support for the struggle against fascist aggression. Indeed, none of the characters here seems more two-dimensional than Hughes himself, who establishes his credentials as a truly competent chronicler of the war precisely by donning a mantle of masculine vigor and heroism, that telltale wound in the arm, that was seen by the medical personnel who attended him as nothing particularly serious, but that clearly was intended, at least in, the, in its first articulation, as a piece of journalism directed at the readers of The Globe, The Afro-American, The Cleveland Call Post, as evidence of Hughes's having been not so much a paid correspondent as a partisan, who, much like the equally well-narrated and advertised Ernest Hemingway, was much more than a disinterested bystander. And while I must give Hughes and indeed all wartime journalists due credit, I nonetheless believe that much of what remains unstated in this particular description of a sunny afternoon on the military and cultural fronts of wartime Madrid is that for many Americans, particularly those who, like Hughes, came of age in the, in the wake of the Spanish-American War, Spain represented a sort of screen against with which the equally important struggles then taking place in the United States of a race, ethnicity, class, labor, and American imperialism might be projected. An even casual perusal of the headlines attending Hughes' dispatches back home suggests 
uh, as even a casual perusal of the headlines attending uses dispatches back home suggests, Hughes bombed in Spain. Organ grinder swings, the name of a song, heard above a gunfire in Spain. New York nurse weds Irish fighter in Spain's war. Fighter from other lands look to Ohio man for food. Pittsburgh soldier hero, but too bashful to talk. St. Louis man Spanish helped him cheat death. Howard man fighting a Spanish loyalist. Harlem ball player now captain in Spain. The logic of the black Americans' participation in the Spanish War was intended to rest outside of the, the Iberian Peninsula itself. Therefore, if you will align my earlier assertion that there may be no easily discernible line of demarcation between the violent, the cultural, and the artistic, then it is fair to assume that this phenomenon, this rejection of the logic inherent in the nursery rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is itself a factor of the flattening of seemingly disparate histories of both cultural and political struggle into single, two-dimensional narratives ready for easy consumption within a variety of social and political contexts. I will now turn to the second of my examples taken from Hughes' five memoir to support what I have labeled the violence of culture and the articulation of Afro-American internationalism and cosmopolitanism. It is a poem embedded in a chapter entitled General Franco's Moors that has so exercised students of Hughes, making an appearance in works by both Brent Hayes Edwards and the historian Robert D.J. Kelly that I will quote it in its entirety. Dear brother at home, we captured a wounded Moor today. He was as dark as me. I said, boy, what you doing here, fighting against the free? He answered something in a language I couldn't understand, but somebody told me he was saying they grabbed him in his land and made him join the fascist army and come across to Spain. And he, had, he said he had a feeling he'd never get back again. He said he had a feeling the whole thing wasn't right. He said he didn't know these folks he had to fight. And as he lay there dying in a village we had taken, I looked across to Africa and I seen foundations shaken. For if a free Spain wins the war, the colonies too are free, then something wonderful can happen to them Moors as dark as me. I said, fellow, listen, I guess that's why old England, and I reckon Italy too, is afraid to let Republic Spain be good to me and you because they got slaves in Africa, and they don't want them free. Listen, Moorish prisoner, here, shake hands with me. I knelt down there beside him, and I took his hand, but the wounded Moor was dying, so he didn't understand. The tragedy that this poem attempts to capture would most certainly not have been lost on Hughes' largely black American readership. For many blacks, the Spanish Civil War was understood in intimate relation to the 1936 Italian invasion of Ethiopia, an independent black African country whose indisputably distinguished history of science, philosophy, and religion had long been taken as proof that black Americans were, as common sense ideology would still have it, the descendants of kings and queens. As James Yates, a black Mississippian who had migrated to Chicago, then New York, finally joining black James Noygas, the American Loyalist Volunteers collectively known as the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, observed, I had been more than ready to go to Ethiopia, but that was different. Ethiopia, a black nation, was part of me. I was just beginning to learn about the reality of Spain and Europe, but I knew what was at stake. There the poor, the peasants, the workers, and unions, the socialists and communists together had won an election against the big landowners, the monarchy, and the right-wingers in the military. It was the kind of victory that would have brought black people to the top levels of government if such an election had been won in the USA. A black man would be governor of Mississippi. Yakes makes patently apparent, end quote, Yakes makes patently apparent the fact that for the nearly 100 black individuals who traveled to Spain with the Lincoln Brigade and the millions of their countrymen and women whom they represented, there was essentially no distinction between Franco's revolution in Spain Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia, and the ongoing exploitation of black Americans in the United States. Indeed, the fact that Oliver Law, whom Yates had met during a poor people's march to the state capital of Illinois, had been made brigade commander, becoming the first black to head an interracial American military unit, continues even today to be recognized as a key moment in the history of both the international struggle against fascism 
as well as the effort to end segregation and white supremacy in the United States. That said, I would argue that Hughes's rather ungainly poem suggests another key field of engagement for partisans in the effort to liberate Loyalist Spain and to advance the cause of black American civil rights. Thousands of so-called Moors, largely Moroccan Arabs, had been pressed into service by Franco's armies to act as shock troops and support staff in engagements at Sevilla, Arama, Brunete, and Madrid itself. They were part of the North African communities who had for years been at the center of complex diplomatic intrigue with Spain's various conservative governments, governments that wished to maintain their hold over their African possessions after the disastrous loss of Spanish colonies following the Spanish-American War. He was shocked, therefore, at encountering an enemy combatant whom he describes as dark as me, was an articulation of some clumsy articulation that Spain and the Iberian Peninsula, Peninsula vital parts of Europe, were in fact white, at least that is, since the fall of the last vestiges of Moorish Arab power at the Alhambra in 1492. More important still, it also further supports my contention that Hughes, like Yates, believed that the struggle in Spain was indeed the very struggle against white supremacy with which black Americans were intimately familiar. The problem, of course, is that Hughes, progressive and cosmopolitan as he was, seemingly had no awareness of the role that black American soldiers, their faces glistening under a tropical sun, had taken during the Spanish-American War only 40-odd years prior to his arrival in Spain. Moreover, Hughes was adamant about the lack of racism on the part of Spaniards, particularly Spanish loyalists, a claim belied by the oft-repeated and, be and believed rumor that Franco had promised the Moorish soldiers their pick of the white Magellanas once the city was finally taken, Cogida. Even stranger still, Hughes never seems to recognize the fact that the Spanish state, with its several language and cultural groups, Castellano, Vasco, Gallego, Catalan, and of course Arabic, as well as its holdings in North Africa and the Canary Islands, hardly comprises a monolithic culture. Thus, though I must rush to applaud Hughes and the many other individuals who waged a truly valiant effort to turn back Franco and his armies, armies whose success allowed the maturation of fascist policies, ideologies, and techniques that would culminate in the horrors of the Second World War. I also believe that, in essence, what these gallant <coughs> men and women were in part doing was choosing between hard and soft versions of imperialist domination in a manner not altogether dissimilar from the Moorish soldier whom Hughes encounters and the black American soldiers whose stories frame this essay. Turning once more then to the unfortunate poem that Hughes includes in his memoir, I would argue that the most serious criticism that can be offered of the great poet's efforts are not so much that he was surprised by his own ignorance, but instead that he cloaked uh, that ignorance in a highly artificial language of black solidarity. The piece is rife with most, the most hackneyed representations of black American dialect. Doing, fighting, saying, feeling, dying, shaking, wrecking, are all somewhat regularly, vulgarly rendered, and indeed unnecessary transcriptions of presumably traditional Black American speech forms, forms of Hughes himself, educated at Columbia and Lincoln Universities, fluent in French and Spanish, and competent in Russian, did not necessarily <clears throat> possess. Moreover, the turn towards the sentimental in the work. That is to say, the soldiers being forced to move, being, fo being forced to move to Spain, come to Spain, is yearning for a lost village, and his tellingly, and tellingly his tragic death, a death that allows pressing questions about how blacks from one part of the diaspora might communicate across yawning chasms of time, space, history, and politics to remain both unanswered and acknowledged. I'm going to read it again. Moreover, this turn toward the sentimental in the work, that is to say, the soldiers being forced to come to. Spain, his yearning for a lost village, and tellingly his tragic death, a death that allows progressing questions about how blacks from one part of the diaspora might communicate across yawning chasms of space, history, and politics, to remain both unanswered and unacknowledged. Before I leave this point, and as I begin to bring this essay to a close, I will say that Hughes and scores of other Afro-American artists who have followed in his wake had themselves regularly been subject to the very flattening of meaning and affect that I have attempted to demonstrate in these pages. 
As I stated above, Hughes is one of the most celebrated, most regularly translated American poets in the Spanish and Portuguese speaking world. But as Vera Kaczynski has quite convincingly argued, Hughes's tendency to produce a sort of coyness in his work, his articulation of a somewhat simple or innocent conception of the intricacies of African diasporic aesthetic and literary practices, iterative practices, his, uh, has allowed him to be translated in ways that might be read as altogether violent to both the author's politics and his art. In his most translated poem, I Too, Hughes boldly articulates the reality of white supremacy and black segregation as they existed and exist in the United States. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and I eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. When one reads the 1926 translation of the poem by Jose Antonio Fernandez de Castro, a prominent and politically progressive editor of Cuba's El Diario, one finds that the work has undergone rather profound changes in order to address a set of social and racial mores distinct from those of, early, of the early 20th century United States. The first, tra- the first stanza reads, Yo también honro a América. Soy el hermano negro. Me mandan a comer a la cocina. Cuando vienen visitas, pero me río como bien y así me fortalezco. I too honor America. I am the black brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when visitors come. But I laugh, eat well, and so strengthen myself. Here one is struck by Kuczynski's rather insightful observation that part of what takes place in de Castro's translation is that he makes the work more instead of less racial. That is to say, de Castro renders the speaker of the poem black instead of dark, as in Hughes' form. <coughs> Just toward the fact that in Cuba, also a white supremacist and color unconscious country, but with nothing like the strict division of black and white persons that existed in the United States, the notion of sending someone from a formal meal simply because he had, as Americans are wont to say, suffered a touch of the tar brush, simply because he was mulatto or perhaps criollo, would have seemed a bit preposterous. This is a simple enough matter, but the fact that Hughes' friend and traveling partner to Spain, Nicolas Guillén, whose own work Hughes had helped to translate into English, would later refer to his estadounidense counterpart as El Mulatico, who wanted to be Negro de Verdad, the little mulatto who wanted to be a real black, a claim that in Cuba might sound cute or charming, but in the United States might find one with a not particularly dark fish smashed rather roughly against the side of one's face, ought, I believe, to alert you to how serious and seriously misunderstood matters of translation can be within what one might call African diasporic poetics. Finally, I will invite back to the table and indeed offer a place of honor to the poet and martyr of the Spanish Civil War, Federico Garcia Lorca, whose Romancero Gitano, Gypsy Ballads, and Bola de Sangre Blood Wedding, Hughes translated and Hughes posthumously published 1940 collection of poems, Poeta and Nueva has inspired generations of black American artists. I'm going to read all of this too in Spanish, just because I like the way it sounds. <laughs> Cuando llegue la luna llena, iré a Santiago de Cuba. Iré a Santiago en un coche de agua negra. Iré a Santiago. Cuando la palma quiere ser cigüeña, iré a Santiago. Y cuando quiere ser medusa el planto, ¿no? Iré a Santiago, iré a Santiago con la rubia cabeza de Conseca, iré a Santiago con, y con el, la, el rosa de Romeo y Julieta, iré a Santiago, mal de papel y plata de monedas, iré a Santiago, o Cuba, o ritmo de semillas secas, iré a Santiago, arpa de troncos vivos, caño, caimán, flor de tabaco, iré a Santiago, Siempre he dicho que yo iría a Santiago en un coche de agra negra. Iré a Santiago, brisa y alcohol en las oeras. Iré a Santiago, mi coral en la, en la tiniebla. Iré a Santiago, el mar ahogado en la arena. Iré a Santiago, calor blanco, fruta muerta. Iré a Santiago, o oh, vino frescor de cañavera, o oh, cuba o curva de suspiro y pájaro, 
iré a Santiago. I must admit that part of what attracts me to this poem, Son de Negros in Cuba, Sound of Blacks in Cuba, is in fact its rhythm, its sound. I would also like to go to Santiago, iré a Santiago, land of palms, bananas, storks, silver coins, flowers of tobacco, coral, rotting fruit, and sugarcane. One must wonder, however, why Garcia Lorca remains so insistent that he will arrive there in un coche de agua negra, a car of black water. Indeed, in Cuba, Cuba, where the word negro, negro, black, might be uttered one moment as the most profound slur, and the next as the gentlest of gestures between lovers, you would be well advised to pay strict attention to the diction and shadings of meanings. In 1898, black American soldiers arrived in Cuba, indeed in Santiago itself, to take up the unlikely task of fighting the good fight of American imperialism, while also liberating not simply themselves, but the whole of the benighted, dispersed African people from the yoke of racist oppression. They found that though they came well equipped with guns and mortar, cannon and shot, what they really needed but what they often lacked were the proper words. Their language was so broken, so caught in a web of misunderstandings and violence, that indeed they might, if they were not careful, lose hold of the very dream that had sent them, herded onto ships like their ancestors of old, sailing across the waters of the warm Caribbean and the cold Pacific, yearning to meet long-lost relations. But when they arrived, the people did not recognize or understand them. They fired bombs and bullets, and the soldiers fired back. I believe that both Hughes and Garcia Lorca understood how difficult, how dangerous it is to speak in languages freighted with the baggage of centuries of bloodletting. In both cases, moreover, these presumably gifted authors, men whose work one might readily celebrate, negotiated this minefield of understanding for as long as they could by turning their words inside and out, placing their toxic knowledge of culture and conquest behind fanciful masks of blues and men and gypsies. They turned their treatises on the duende, the imp, the spirit, the ghost, or black soul that Garcia Lorca so famously and lavishly attempted to explain into high art. I read them now against the grain of received expectations, name the uncomfortable places that they were forced to inhabit, the dangerous routes, R-O-U-T-E-S, that they attempted to traverse, not because I believe that they were always successful in their endeavors, but, because, but instead because I am stunned by the violence, the shocking goal that would lead them to trial. As Hughes sat before the House Committee on Un-American Activities, claiming that no matter how long he might have sojourned in loyalist Spain or revolutionary Russia, that he was, in fact, no communist. As Garcia Lorca stood on the Spanish hillside, brave or groveling, enraged or amused, as fascist soldiers raised their guns to take him from this life to the next, one bullet to the head, another to the heart, the violence of culture made manifest, one wonders what lessons they had learned, what they would have liked to teach the generations that would come after. One thing is certain, the methods that they established to produce their literature, the masks that they created to allow them to create beauty in the midst of horror have been broken. Their blues and their ballads, heard only as rhythm, timbre, and technique, have begun to sound outdated and cracked. I will leave you then with the charge that the work of the contemporary critic, our work, is to risk the difficult crossings that these men once tried, to attempt to break out of established modes of understanding, to mine the works that we most value for not only their formal pleasures, but also the legacies of bravery, vigor, and profound belief in the possibility of undirected travel that these strangely translated artists and partisans of human possibility attempted to accomplish. Indeed, though we're not certain of where we're going, we know we can never turn back. Thank you. Questions, comments? Um, first of all, really, really excellent lecture. I very much enjoyed it. Um, and I couldn't help but sort of thinking at several points in time. 
that there were really interesting reverberations between what you speak to about the experience of black soldiers fighting for the United States yeah. um, and the imperial wars that they were fighting in predominantly black countries. Right. Um, well, yeah, yeah, okay. But yeah. um, so like multi-ethnic society. Yeah. Um, and what is currently happening with, um, for example, Muslim Americans. Uh, having to fight in predominantly Muslim countries. And I was just wow. wondering if you had any... <laughs> you want to ask me something simple like that? <laughs> I think that I can't really speak to... I can't speak to what you're saying directly. I can speak generically to what you're saying. That part of the strength of American culture is this whole idea that, especially sort of post um, Barack Obama, there is no face of America anymore, right? We're not exactly a post-racial country. No, that's not exactly true, but that any old person can look like an American. We all look like Americans. Part of the difficulty is that once you give up on, uh, and I'm a person who, in my own politics, is very much concerned with giving up on certain forms of nationalism, right? So I tend to not refer to myself as an African-American, I refer to myself as a black American. Not because I don't think that I have a solidarity with, and not because I'm not in solidarity with African people, but because I think it's too easy to imagine that my experience, having grown up in North Carolina and, and living in New York City, is exactly the same as people living on the African continent, right? And that you, it's a political thing that we have to do. The problem there, the difficulty, however, is that when that happens, you also get into situations in which uh, part of the reason that there has been, at least among people of color in the United States, really profound concern with talking about racial difference and, and championing it, right, has been that it's been a way to resist some of the worst aspects of American culture. As that sort of gets ground down, for good reasons, I think, um, that's been uh, a real albatross for many of us. Uh, as that is ground down, also, there, you have to develop new forms of politics, and you have to develop new forms of culture. Now, I'll stop there and say, I'll stop there because I'm no more confident at, at developing those new forms of, of, uh, of, um, of culture and politics than yours. As a matter of fact, you're younger than me, it's your job to do that, you know. But it does seem to me that one of the things that, we, that intellectuals have to do is sort of imagine how it is that we can speak as Americans and speak as Americans who are engaged in really some awful projects around the, around the planet, including the Middle East and, and other places in the world as well, um, but not have a racialist critique of, uh, of, of those projects, but also have a critique that is actually functional of those projects. I'm not exactly certain how to do it. I think that there probably are people in the room who are better aware of what the answer to that actually is. It's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Actually, you said back to the youth again. Um, yeah. You said that the youth were ignorant of certain things, you know, especially when he was shocked. When he confronted the Shmuel, the Moorish soldier, the dying Moorish uh, soldier. Yeah. But again, uh, there were instances in uh, US history where the uh, black, black soldiers actually were fighting uh, America's uh, imperialist wars, you know particularly in genocides against the, you know, the Native American right. uh, Indians and whatnot. Secondly, I think uh, I, I did some research on the wars, actually, in uh, who, put, who were the spearhead of the fascist uh, yeah. uh, reconquest of, uh, of Spain between goats and goats by uh, Franco, you know, at that time. Uh, Ideologically, I mean, they were pitted against the uh, Republicans under the pretext that uh, they were fighting infidel uh, atheists. You know? right. Because, because uh, religiously speaking, uh, predominantly they were Muslim at that time, so they were mobilized on, on the basis that they were fighting a war against uh, atheists or something like that. This is, uh, I mean, this is something important. It's totally important. Yeah. There's uh, two things I would say about that. Is I, I again think that a number of ways in which human beings, human societies, organize themselves can be used both to, you can use them at both to positive and negative effect in the same gesture, right? So I think that that's what the, the second point that you make. I want to say that I don't think, however, that Langston Hughes was ignorant about the reality 
of wars in North Africa. I think that the presentation of the dying war is, or the more who has no idea of how it is that he has arrived in Spain is much more palatable to the audiences that Hughes is writing to, an audience that is really struggling to understand itself as, in fact, African. One of the things that you have to remember about um, uh, the latter part, of the first part of the 20th century and Afro-American life is that the Harlem Renaissance so happens, happens in the 1920s. It happens at the moment at which um, Black Americans um, generally have no more lived history, no more lived understanding or memory of, of slavery, and very little um, understanding of, of being African people, right? And are very, very American people. It becomes a moment at which uh, Afro-American people become very interested in the African continent, precisely the moment at which there's very little, there's no more connection. That's something that develops well until the 1960s. And I think that part of what is going on there is that there is a, that progressive black thought says we are an African people. We're not distinct from, we're not distinct from other Africans. But that on the ground, when Afro-American people actually can come face to face with other people in the African diaspora, there really are um, pretty profound differences that you can see uh, until today, really sort of papered over by a lot of Afro-American persons who want, we refer to ourselves as African-American people. Now, the funny thing about that is that it wasn't until I was in my 20s that, that African-American people started referring to ourselves as African-American people, right? Um, and I'm not, but so old, for God's sake. You know, and that a uh, generation before we thought of ourselves as black persons, a generation before that we thought of ourselves as Negroes, a generation before that we thought of ourselves as colored. And so that this idea, so that we've become increasingly African as we have, we're further, we're further away from the African continent. And it's because that politics has actually been something that's been important to us. So on the Langston Hughes thing, the only thing I would say is I think that he was altogether aware of what he was doing, um, especially someone like Hughes, who's as sophisticated as he is. I think that, however, he's also a poet who understands that you have to use certain types he wanted to produce certain types, my guess is that he wanted to produce certain types of narratives that were actually going to be powerful and that were going to be useful for the, the way that, that politics and culture worked at that time. That's my guess. Please. A uh, comment on the question. It seems to me, I'm very much enjoying your talk. Thank you. It seems to me that it's impossible to understand, make sense of the experience of the U.S. and also say, all along in Spain, without placing it in the context of the popular front government of Spain, mm. which out of the wish not to antagonize France, England, and so forth, did not proclaim independence for the Spanish colonies in Africa. Right. Um, and there were contrasts. Let me say Padmore or C.M.R. James would have taken, did take a different right. type of that. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is, are you familiar with the Afro-Cuban I am. And so that's a question? Yeah. Yes. Is the answer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I do it in the But its contribution seems to be quite relevant. It's funny. It is so funny that you should say this, and because you have now hit upon exactly the place where I am wildly sort of resistant and sort of juvenile, and I get sort of juvenile about it and, and, and kicking and screaming about it. It's because I've now done, talked about this, this talk a lot and people are constantly trying to get me to talk about um, a, a variety of figures, particularly in Cuba, right? Uh, and I'll tell you why I'm resistant. And I wish that I had, I wish there was some sophisticated um, reason it is not. Uh, it's because I just have gotten my head around the project and I'm like, if I, if I add the Cubans in, I'm done, I'm dead. You know, just because it becomes a much more complicated set, set of uh, set of concerns. So I really have to. I've thought about it, and I specifically, in almost every time I give it, someone says almost oh, it's almost exactly what you're saying. So maybe eventually it'll it'll break through because I hear it all the time, and I'm all, I'm always in, in agreement with it, and I always apologize for saying, no, nope, I can't. No, I'm just not going to talk about that. I'm not going to look over there, just because the project has become sort of, in a way talking about just Afro-Americans in Spain is, is unwieldy. Um, once you start talking about Cuba, 
it becomes a very, very large project. I don't want to just do um, Afro-Americans and, and the Hispanic. And also, just to add to this, I'm deeply concerned about the fact about what it means that Hughes's real relation to the Hispanic is Mexico, right? Is Mexico, right? His father moves to Mexico for most of his life. He spends years in Mexico. He is very, very deeply involved in Mexican culture. And so I'm not exactly certain how to, how to figure that out. I, I mean, that's a real admission. I wish I, I had a better I had a better response to it than that. You know, it's funny. I always, the way that I, I've been doing it is I've been saying, I've been sort of, I secretly take down notes about it. And um, I put the notes away. And, um, and I, I, I want to figure out how to actually pull it in together into a manuscript. It's, an, it's a really just an issue about the writing, not about the conceptualization of it. Please. Uh, just to make sure you said that um, well, when you were saying that, that there's become a strengthening of, 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 of African identity among African, African Americans, mm -hmm. they become increasingly aware of the African descent. Do yeah. um, you think this is a negative development by stating that you would, you would call yourself Black American rather than African American? I'm a grouchy old fart. You, this is the first thing you have to remember. So, you know, part of the reason that, that I call myself a black American is I just want to remind people that we, that it's, that this is something that happened in our lifetime, right? So I don't have an issue about people referring to themselves as African American. What I would say, however, and the part of this talk that I think is unbelievable, I've always just known my audience is, just wants to, you know, shoot me in the head, is that I'm talking about sort of military history for the first half of the talk, right? Um, and part of what I really believe is that that ability to understand ourselves as African people is not something that happened in a vacuum. It's something that happened because of um, a specifically martial roots, M-A-R-T-I-A-L roots, right? And that it's impossible to talk about, or I don't know that it's quite, it's impossible to talk about the development of um, Africanicity, or, or African pride, if you will, among the Afro-American population without talking about the fact that the United States itself has been, has had incursions in all over the globe, but particularly into um, black countries and African countries that have been spearheaded by the military, by the military specifically. And so how you actually hold those two things in your hand, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say that that it's a negative thing to, to, for us to think of ourselves as African people. I don't believe that. But how do you actually hold those two things in your hand? Yes, we're African people, but the way that we know that we're African people is that we're literally on shipping routes that are maintained by gunships, right? And we're li literally following routes that are about removing resources from the continent and bringing them to the United States and that we're following the same path. So that is something that I think is very, it's profound. It's really, really a profound thing for us to understand. People do get it, but how you actually you say it all in the same sentence is something that, that I'm really concerned with. I, I would hope that that gets sort of what you are talking about. Please. Yeah, I, I just thought that we have connection. You said something to the point of the effect I could be mistaken that the Africans are, in a way, complicit in their own, in, in their enslavement? What I believe is that there's a Hegelian notion that Africans exist outside of history, right? And I believe that one of the things that is, you have to, we now have to start to ask, is something about whether or not we will continue to imagine enslaved persons, and I'm talking about actually on board slave ships, as people who were not actors. So I wouldn't use the word complicit because I know that it's a charged word, I do. But I'm trying very, very hard to not be a person who says that enslavement is something that happened, that history is something that happened to people of uh, the African continent, that happened to African Americans, and not something that either we resisted, if that's a word that's better for people, but that we in some ways had some real participation in. I think that the truth 
of the matter for particularly African American persons is that our history is imagined as being a history that was imposed on us. And I think that the future has to be a history in which there was an attempt to impose an, uh, um, a history and an identity on us, on us. And that there was real, there was a back and forth. That's what the hegemonic actually is. There was a back and forth about what that history and that identity would actually be. So I will say to you that it's a great question. And I will say to you that part of what I've been doing off stage is that I've become really interested in um, theories of space. And so uh, I'm really interested in whether or not you could have knowledge and you could have activity that is in the dark, that is, in, that is cramped, that, is, that you could talk about human beings who are, actor, who are actors, not simply when they are in the light and when they have broken out of the hold of the ship. But those men, the truth of our history is that we are persons who, are, who begin our, our sojourn and, and who begin our sojourn as New World African peoples below deck and who begin our, our sojourn as people who have been, who are, who are cramped. And it's important to me to think about that cramped, that crampedness and that um, being held, and yet that being held is not being a place at which our humanity is at, is, is at all diminished. That, by the way, interestingly enough, is what I think is the import of that Fred Hayes Edwards stuff that I was saying. That he talks about the fact that um, there's a distinction between diaspora and exile, and that it may be time for African American persons to value our diaspora, to value the fact that we're traveling people, to value the fact that we're people in the world, versus to only bemoan the fact that we're people in the, we're people in the world and to only the moment after we've been separated from what we imagine is our original culture. Please. Yeah, um, I guess a, a quick comment following up and, and then a question. Uh, I mean, I, I think your general line of thought there has to be absolutely right. I mean, it, there's no way to consistently affirm any kind of agency or, or resistance or liberatory power uh, if you don't also affirm some kind of activity when you're being oppressed. Yeah. Uh, so, otherwise that... that Resistance just comes out of nowhere magically at some point in history. I should say that if this were a black audience, people would be more happy. I'm sure. Because it's, yeah. it's part, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that this isn't a black audience, it's a black girl audience, you know, that, uh, <laughs> that it would be more being happier. I'm not doing the worst stereotypes of black people, right? Um, um, we're actually lovely, wonderful kind of people. Um, but that part of the issue is that that affirming of agency at the moment of the most oppressive moment is also gets to the idea of have you been complicit, have you in fact been complicit in your own oppression, and have you been complicit in the oppression of other people. It's a very, it's a very troubling issue, particularly for our people. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, so uh, an awful lot to assimilate in your, in your talk. Uh, and. Uh, I was particularly interested in, to, in some of your comments about violence yeah. and some of the oppositions, or, or maybe not oppositions, but the distinctions you wanted to draw and then also collapse or bring together uh, between violence in culture and violence in art. And to be frank, I didn't quite follow what you wanted to do uh, with those distinctions as well as I would have liked. So I'm, w I'm wondering if you could say more about the operation of violence in culture or, or, or the, uh, the necessary condition of violence for culture as you see it or as you see it in, in your talk today. I and then, that, I hope that it's not necessary. But and, then, and then also of art in particular, because that was, that was I, less you clear. Can talk a little bit about diaspora a little bit? And the reason that it, someone pointed out to me that it's interesting uh, that if you think particularly of Afro American people as being uh, people who have been really significant to the African diaspora, right? Both as people who have thought about the African diaspora and have been, uh, have been personnel in that. If you read a text today about Afro Americans and traveling and Afro Americans in the African diaspora, the people who are um, discussed are almost exclusively. Um, pretty much highbrow intellectuals, let's say W.E.B. Du Bois, right? Nice to use the novel, for example. The average black person who has left the United States is a soldier. Full stop. 
and that the and that he generally has existed in other countries, lived in other countries, um, been a part of other countries, been a part of other uh, cultures, in numbers that absolutely dwarf um, uh, um, black people of any other profession. Full stop. That one of the things that I'm really interested in is whether or not that means that at least from the context that I'm interested in, whether or not you can start talking about the diaspora as being something that is sort of metaphysical, right? We imagine the sort of slavery happened and boom, black people went to the, to the uh, ends of the, of the planet. But, and, and stop that, but instead start thinking that actually diaspora has been formed not simply by slavery, but also by militarism. But there's a sort of mili uh, militarized diaspora. So that I'm not certain, for example, that you can talk about the movement of um, at least Afro-American cultural forms. I, well, it's not even that I'm not certain. I know you could not talk about the movement of Afro-American cultural forms without talking about the movement of, uh, of, 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 of the American military. It's just an impossibility. Um, I guess that you guys probably know that Penny and Von Ashen book, um, Sachman Blows Up the World. Um, and one of the things that it, it almost says, it doesn't exactly say this, but you know that there's a there's a 20th century jazz craze that, that overtakes that just takes over the planet, right? Um, and there are um, black jazz musicians who travel all over the planet. They're fun to the CIA. And you know that part of what is going on there is that the movement of uh, of pieces of, uh, of Afro-American culture that are extremely precious to us, extremely precious to us, have been um, articulated in situations outside of what we think of as our traditional locations, precisely through media that many of us find involved in, right? And that if, you, I don't know that you can actually continue to have what looks like a progressive politics or continue to have what I think of as a as a sharp intellectualism without taking that into account. I, I hope that that gets to work for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.